All right, this is John Cola with GrowingYourGreens.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you. And in this episode, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk to MIT, the master grower here, about growing medicinal uh, cannabis, you know, without the use of chemical pesticides and fertilizers. You know, I consider North Coast Naturals the leaders in growing clean, green, certified medicinal cannabis, and that's why we're gonna talk to him today. So now, for those of you guys that haven't tuned into my show before, you know, I did film two other episodes here at North Coast Naturals, which I'll put links to there and there. Um, and you're going to want to check out those videos before actually you watch this video to get filled in on some important information, including seeing a tour of the facility here on how exactly they grow and some of the things and products they use to grow clean green certified, which is basically like growing organic organically uh, for the cannabis. And then over on this side, I did a previous Q&A uh, with MIT to ask them some questions more about the North Coast Naturals and some of their products and more specific questions uh, for him. But this episode is going to focus on the pest because you know both him and I would agree that it's very important to get the pesticides, whether you're growing you know fruits and vegetables or medicinal herbs, out of your garden completely because they are devastating and even more so than getting it out of your fruit and vegetable garden I really want you guys to get out of you know if you're growing medicinal cannabis because you're you're smoking it up so MIT why is it so important to get rid of using the chemical pesticides in the medicinal cannabis well it's important for uh, I mean for quite simply for health reasons if there weren't any health ramifications we could use chemicals all day long on everything and it wouldn't really matter. But the fact of the matter is, is that for the same reasons you wouldn't want to spray as you don't, and as you don't uh, patronize those that do, you wouldn't want to spray fruits and vegetables with chemicals uh, that are going to uh, kill pests or kill funguses or mildews or molds or things like that. You don't want to be spraying your cannabis plants, um, whether they're for medical purposes or recreational purposes in the states where that's legal. You don't want to be using those chemicals on those things either. And, um, and it's even worse for the reasons that you just mentioned, John, when you're using it in cannabis because you will either extract the, uh, the cannabinoids from the flower into some sort of uh, compound that you ingest, or you will smoke or vaporize the flower, the dried flower, and hopefully dried and cured flower, and, um, and, and you know, ingest it in that fashion, which is a much more volatile way of ingesting it because you're obviously lighting it on fire, breathing it into your lungs, and it's immediately into your bloodstream. And for the many people that do use cannabis, again, for whatever purpose, uh, here it's obviously all medical and all different forms of, of medical needs, um, to have a medicine that has those chemicals in it, which in 90% of the cases, you're not even aware that they're there, is defeating the purpose at best and making it worse at worst. Wow, wow. I mean. I definitely agree. We want to get out of the chemicals, and now I'm actually going to ask him some questions on how he deals with different insects and pests, you know, in the grow in a natural um, fashion. All right, MIT. So first, I want to ask you, what are some of the top pests that may occur in your grow? You know, just in general, that people may be exper experiencing if they have an indoor cannabis grow. Well, there, there's there's several. There's a whole broad range of pests that are common. Um, some are more detriment, detrimental to other than, than others. Um, some uh, are, are more common than others. I'll sort of focus on the ones that we pay particular attention to at North Coast, and other cannabis growers out there will recognize these and um, and definitely be able to relate. And it's our hope that maybe they will start adopting some of these practices now that they understand that a they're available and b that they work and that they work, that uh, they'll start adopting these practices and implementing them and creating healthier gardens for themselves, their friends, their patients, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, so, uh, spider mites, very common problem on the insect front. Um, the common solution to that is fluoromite. Another common solution to that is avid. We don't use either. Avid is uh, probably the worst thing that you can be spraying on your plants. It is a systemic pesticide, a systemic insecticide, which means that even if you spray your plants when they're just this big, it's always going to be resident in the plant. It is systemically, it is in the system of the plant. And two months later, when the final, final flower is produced, that avid will be in there. And so what you're doing is you're infecting your flowers 
which is particularly onerous, again, if it's a medical context, you're infecting your flowers with a chemical that is, I mean, completely undesirable. How undesirable? I mean, I've heard things, and uh, again, this is anecdotal information, but I've heard things uh, like recently someone up in, in North, Northern California was simply processing medicine, simply trimming final product to get it ready um, to, to be consumed by medical users. And granted, the person in question had a strong sensitivity to chemical agents, but she died. She died uh, just by simply processing medical cannabis or so-called medical cannabis that had been used, uh, that had avid been used on it and with it for the simple purpose of, of fighting most probably spider mites. You don't need to do that. You don't need to be using that. And again, do the research yourself. I was told this anecdotally. I don't know all the facts about it, but I hear things similar to this, um, not that extreme by any means, but similar to this about how many growers will use Avid, not just at this stage of the game, but at later stages of the game when the flowers are actually produced. And I've got a confession to make, John. Years and years ago when I was a hobby grower and I was growing with synthetics, I used Avid in these in these sorts of conditions. I never used them in the flowering cycle, but I used them in the veg in the vegetative state because I just simply didn't know any better. And I had spider mites, or I wanted to prevent spider mites, and I turned to that. And again, I didn't know any better. So learn from the mistakes that I made, please, and don't do the same things. Um, what are the all natural forms you can you can turn to to combat this common problem? Well, there's several. First of all, there's neem oil. Uh, and neem oil is, is an extraction that's made from the neem seed. The, uh, we use that here. There's azadiractin, which is a concentrate that's, uh, they take a specific compound in neem. They use that. There's a couple manufacturers that make that. That's approved for organic farming. Um, so there's two right there. In addition to that, rid bugs work, to spe works, and especially in combination with the neem and the azadiractin. That's one of the things that we do here in our IPMS, our integrated pest management system. And another natural thing that we use here at, uh, at North Coast, which sounds like a very extreme thing, and you talked about this yeah. when you were looking at it, is a product called Exterminator. It has a skull and crossbones on it. Actually, this is a, this is a wonderful product that is all naturally derived. It's, it's an enzyme and it's all natural, it's been approved by Clean Green Certification Program, just like all of our inputs have. Uh, and it's an enzyme that we simply make into a foliar spray, although you can use it as a root drench as well, and we have. Um, you can make it into a foliar spray and you spray it on the plant, you cover the complete surface of the leaf in both the top and the bottom, and it, it will kill spider mites, it will kill broad mites, it will kill any sort of pest uh, that is insect related on that surface, uh, on, the, on the leaf surface and it does it all natural. And it's absolutely compatible with all the other things that you want to use on a foliar, you know, in a foliar standpoint. You have to use it as a standalone, but you can use it and integrate it into your integrated pest management system. So we use that, we use just simple rosemary oil. You can use rosemary oil, it makes pests not want to go on your plant, as well as it will kill on contact. There's other things like cedar oil, clove oil, um, Rid Bugs is comprised of a couple of those things. There's a product, although we haven't used it here, but I know organic growers or, or all natural growers, I should say, that, um, that use it. A uh, product called Organicide, which is a fish emulsion combined with a cottonseed oil. So there are other products out there that you can turn to to combat spider mites, which again is an extremely uh, uh, common problem. Relatedly, broad mites, uh, much less common than, than, than spider mites, but much, much more difficult um, to get a handle on if you can even see them. You need a much more powerful microscope to see them. They do their damage much quickly and they can wipe, wipe out a crop in days. I know someone that got an infestation, thought that there were nutrient deficiencies when he looked at his canopy. Um, got an infestation simply because someone came over to visit his site and was in his room. Again, this is a fully legitimate, represented by attorney medical uh, grow. And he had one of his collective members come over, visit his room, Unbeknownst to him, they brought in spider mites with them. One of the reasons that we have the protocols that we do here at North Coast, uh, I mean, he brought in the broad mites, rather. Brought in broad mites with them, three days later, the crop was wiped out. Tremendous loss to that collective from the standpoint of time, effort, energy, and medicine that was destined to patients. So, you know, there are things that you can use, the exterminator, the neem, uh, rid bugs, uh, rosemary are the ones that we use here. Additionally, we use, this is not a spray, this is not a liquid form, but something called diatomaceous earth, which I think you reviewed earlier. I did. Yeah. 
That is absolutely a fantastic form of, of insect control. You see it on some of the plants right there, that one back there in the corner. That's got a bunch of white stuff on it that looks like some, some kind of mildew or some kind of mildew or some kind of mold. It's actually diatomaceous earth. And that acts as a microscopic, uh, imagine broken glass, broken shards of glass on a very, very small basis. You cover the leaf surface with it. Insects simply walk across it, become dehydrated from the cuts that their bodies uh, accumulate, and they dehydrate and die. And it works on broad mites, spider mites, all sorts of things. Very few growers that I've talked to use that. It's, it's, it's very uncommonly used, and that's a great example of, things, uh, of, of a way that you can use something that's very common in the gardening industry in practice and take it over to the medicinal or recreational cultivation um, side of it and use it there. So these things exist. Use them. Experiment with them. Use them on a preventative basis. Maintain the proper cultural practices such as these things, and you can defeat a lot of these problems, the broad mites, the spider mites, Again, from an insect standpoint, are probably the most devastating and common. You can feed a lot of these problems straight out of the gate. Wow, I mean, I totally agree. I use some of these same products in my regular garden and have videos on some of these products already, including the neem and Dr. Bronner's salsa soaps and how to apply it with a special, you know, fogger that I use that would be really excellent to use in a medicinal grow like this. And I'm also upcoming, or maybe already even have an episode on the diatomaceous earth, which I'm also going to have an episode on where to get it for the lowest price and the best way that I'm going to choose to apply it and different ways to apply it. It's going to be really cool. So, I mean, check my videos because I have a lot of information that are applicable to this kind of grow or just, you know, fruits and vegetables. So, I might want to ask you about another real common problem that actually I'm having in my garden right now outside, not my inside garden because I don't have one. But it's uh, simply um, powdery mildew or PM. I know some people may get this. And can you even deal with this organically, and what do you do? Well, the answer is very simply that yes, you can deal with it organically. Many, many growers of medical grade or recreational grade cannabis will use a product called Eagle 20. Uh, I will admittedly uh, confess that I don't know all the details and ins and outs of, of Eagle 20. Again, when I was doing synthetics years ago and I didn't know any better, I used it, and it worked beautifully. Again, Eagle 20, your product is fantastic. The problem is that it's chemically based and now you're going to have a chemical on your leaf surface and that leaf surface is, is, is part of the plant that you're going to ingest, smoke or vaporize at some point. And that, why would you have that when you can use an all natural approach? Typically speaking, the two most common all natural approaches, uh, one is using what's known as a sulfur burner where you burn sulfur in your room and what that does is creates a sulfur fog and that fog changes the pH on the leaf surface, the pH, so it makes it more alkaline or acid, I'm not really sure which, I think it makes, more, it makes it more alkaline, and the mildew, the molds can't live on the leaf surface in that environment. What we use, what we prefer, is a product called actinovate, which is a specific biological fungicide. Again, approved for organic farming, clean green certified, you put it in a foliar mix, you spray it on the leaf, and these little, I don't know what they're called, microbes or something, you know, biological act, you know, agents. actors. <laughs> They're <laughs> agents of biologics. Secret agents, swagents, if you will. They, they go in there and they'll just simply eat the powdery mildew. Um, so you, you can use that. There's a product uh, called uh, OG Bio or Foliar. They have a Foliar um, uh, product. We use the root product. We're actually going to start experimenting and doing some R&D with the, with the Foliar product. We don't use it, it's gotten great reviews, we're intrigued, we're looking into it, and we're happy to, to, happy to experiment with it. You can use that. Um, so there are different options that you can turn to without having to resort to chemicals. We turn to those options, we encourage you to do the same thing. With respect to the Actinovate that we use, I can assure you, as long as you get Actinovate that is alive, it will work. It will work. If you have a heavy outbreak, you may have to apply it more often than if you were just doing a preventative. In fact, you probably will, but it will work. We've seen the results. Wow, yeah, let's talk about getting uh, some good activity. You know, just because you order it online and get it mail order, does that mean it's gonna work? It, it may work, it depends on the season. If you order it in the winter time and it's been shipped quickly, uh, then you're probably gonna be good to go as long as it's fresh, which it probably will be. If you're ordering it in the summer, June, July, something like that, it might, it's my understanding that the place that makes it, the, the factory, if you will, where they cultivate the microbes, that's in Texas or someplace like that. And if it's traveling, you know, via long haul shipping, 
then and it's it's going on Route 10 or wherever it's going, and it's suffering from being an extendedly high temperature environment for extendedly long periods of time, what could end up happening is your actinomate could arrive dead on arrival. And then you'll be, unbeknownst to you, spraying it, using it, and uh, not seeing the results that you want, and you'll be saying to yourself, you know, this actinovate stuff, this doesn't work. And MIT says it does, and he doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, there's a lot of things that I don't know what I'm talking about, <laughs> but this is actually one of the things that I do. So if you're going to use actinovate like we suggest, and we encourage you to do, make sure that you're getting it fresh. If you're getting it uh, from someplace, make sure that it's, that it's alive. And if you have to order it, order it in a way that it's delivered as fast as possible and it's not traveling in a, in a, in a hot situation. Yeah, I mean, definitely, it's very really important when getting any biologic agent that's alive to make sure it's still alive. And, you know, good manufacturers will put, number one, expiration dates on there, which is something to go by. But more importantly, you know, how is that treated? What is it in a hot warehouse? Sitting in a hot warehouse in maybe a local grow shop, they're selling it, but they're not running the air conditioner because they're too cheap. Or was it shipped in a UPS truck where it's sitting in the UPS truck and it's 100 degrees outside? I mean, these are, these are not good things when you're buying bi biologic agents. You want to be aware of this. You know, another question I want to ask you, MIT, is about the dreaded fungus gnats and things like that, you know, that get in the soil. Because, I mean, you know, I'm going to tell you guys straight up that I visited his facility and I saw that he had, had some traps out and he was catching fungus gnats. If you're doing it so good, how come you had some fungus gnats in there? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, and, and admittedly, we have fungus gnats, and, it, and it's funny because we have not had any sort of insect problem, not one insect problem until that. And the way that it happened, and again, guys, uh, make sure, that, again, that you're following protocols and processes that you actually set up. The first part is to know which ones to set up. The second and potentially more difficult uh, piece of the puzzle is to, is to actually have the discipline to follow them, follow them on a routine and a consistent basis. And we got some uh, plants from a licensed uh, medical dispensary here in California. Um, one with a great reputation, and they were fantastic plants. We brought them in and we followed our protocols. Our protocols dictate that we bring in a plant from anywhere, a nursery that we trust or, or, or someone that's a member of our collective that wants to contribute uh, a plant, um, and that, that's legally allowed and, and, and encouraged, actually, in the spirit of 215. We take that plant and we do an exterminator foliar on it, again, to, so if there's any bugs or anything like that, those are killed. Not satisfied with that, we actually apply diatomaceous earth, which is why that plant over there has the DE on it and the other ones don't. We got that and we brought it in and we followed protocols. What we didn't do, this is the mistake that we didn't make, and this is my fault and as, as someone that has established many of these protocols, is we didn't do a root zone flush to make sure that the root zone was clean of any pests whatsoever. And, um, and because we didn't do a root zone flush, several weeks later, I think it was about, um, six, seven weeks later, all of a sudden we started seeing flying gnats, or you know, what had been gnats are now flying around the room. And it was easy to trace them back to the, to the host, and the, you know, the problem got propagated across the entire room and into the other room, and it was just, I mean, it's, it, I wouldn't go so far as to call it a disaster because they're not actually that detrimental to, to the crop, but at North Coast, we don't want bugs here. We do a lot of work to make sure that they don't come in here. When we see bugs, we're up in arms. So we've addressed that situation. Um, but again, a warning to you guys, you know, when you're bringing in a plant, never assume that it's okay. Always 100% assume, 100% uh, of the time assume that there's a problem with it from that standpoint and hit it with the things on a preventative basis that you normally would use. Be extra diligent, extra vigilant, and extra focused about this, and you'll be safe. All right, so what did you use to get rid of the fungus gnats once you got them? Well, we used a couple different things, and let me start with the things that didn't work. <laughs> we, we tried an, an Azimax flush, that didn't work. Uh, I, I think it's maybe the Azimax was old or something, something like that. I'm not going to look at you in the eye and say that Azimax doesn't work as a root zone flush. We've heard reports that it did. Uh, it didn't in, 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 in our experience. Um, we would try it again, though. Again, I've heard that it works. Uh, the second thing we tried is a product called Microlift, which is actually, we're using it in a way that's not specifically intended for. It will kill things like that. Um, that are in freestanding water. We've heard that it works in the root zone, we tried it, that didn't have the effect that we desired. Now, uh, well, the plants have actually been harvested, so the problem is hopefully gone, but we, what we would turn to is a product called GoNats, which uh, I forget what that's derived from, but I do know that it's all natural. That would, be, that would be one approach. The other approach that we would take, which I've actually used in my past life is a synthetic-based gardener, hydroponic-oriented gardener, or nematodes, which 
I think that we should use because I know that they've worked in the past. We just haven't used them here, given our setup isn't quite as conducive to how it was in the past hydroponically. So, uh, nematodes I would say you should turn to in the, in the instance of fungal gnats. Uh, it's possible that the exterminator would work. We used it as a preventative in this instance for that plant. Um, it certainly should work if you do it thoroughly enough, and then go nats would be your other best bet. But let us know. Let, you guys tell us. Yeah, what post, you've post comments with. down below if you have some organic controls for fungus gnats. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what 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 I believe in is uh, open source knowledge. You know, if you're an, if you're a natural grower like they are here at North Coast Naturals, you know, they're going to share their information with you guys so that you now you guys can get off the chems. You guys can use natural techniques. And if you guys know something, you could share with them so that we could all learn as a community and make the world a better place because really the evils out there are those chemical companies in my opinion because I mean they got the big dollars of by politicians and I'm not even going to get into that stuff. But we really need to get back to, to nature and natural growing and there are ways that are effective to do it. So another thing I want to ask you, MIT, very important is what are some of these cultural practices that you talk about, you know, like we're wearing these suits, I mean, what are some of the most important things that some of the growers or people out there should be doing to minimize the risk of getting pests in the first place, right? Like, I don't want to contract any crazy ass sexual transmitted diseases, so I double wrap it, you know? But uh, if, if you're growing medicinals, you know, what are some things that you could do so that you don't get contract any sexual diseases? <laughs> I'd like to comment on the STD question, um, but I, I will say, you know, very simply, there are several things. There are, there are several things that you should do and can do, and, and we, we try to do as many of those as, as we possibly can um, that are practically feasible. And um, you know, you saw earlier, I believe, that we have two curtains in between our uh, grow zone and in between uh, that zone and, and, and the zone that you use to approach it. Uh, that's again a light lock to make sure that there's no light risk that enters our modules during the lights off cycle uh, when people pass through and go in and out, or perhaps if a plant's taken out into the hallway to be worked on or looked at or, or notes need to be taken or pictures need to be taken for research and development purposes, things like that. Um, uh, so that's one thing. You want to, you want to separate your zone from anywhere else uh, that's tangential to it. Uh, secondly, you want to have dedicated clothes. We have very specific clothes that we wear that we only wear here. They come here, they go home, they get washed, they get dried, then they come right back. The shoes that I'm wearing right here, and I'll spare you uh, the camera close up of looking at them, any shoes will do. They are only for this area. They haven't been worn outside ever. They were bought new, they're used in here new. Additionally, on top of that, if, if that wasn't enough, we also wear what we call the space suits. So if there are, for some weird reason, a problem on, on my shirt, I was somewhere else uh, in the building wearing this shirt and there's a problem, I have another barrier of protection. All of those things. And of course, treating any plants that you bring in in the way that we described, or perhaps even a better way. And if you have a better way, please share it with us. All of these things combined are going to prevent the problems in the first place. And they say that, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure, yeah. or they say something like that. But anyway, the point is, is that you want to be ahead of the game. You always want to be ahead of the game on the prevention side of these problems so that they don't happen in the first place. Additionally, do your insects check. Here at North Coast, we have actual you know, markers on the calendar for when you know, we go in and we'll inspect the leaf with a 60 to 1 scope and actually look for insects. So if problems do occur, we catch them early, hopefully, and we can address them early while the problem's small rather than big. We do it every three days, we do it every three days for that reason. Do that. Um, the problem is that most, most growers don't. They are too busy doing one thing or another thing, and maybe it's not their fault they can't get to it, and I understand that. Because again, it takes time and effort and, and vigilance to do that on a consistent basis. That's one of the things that I'd like to think makes us different. Um, but do that. If you're concerned about pests, if you've had problems in the past, your cultural practices are going to save you nine times out of ten. And then when you do the preventative stuff, the preventative foliars to address uh, the anticipation, the expectation that there's a problem, the assumption that there's a problem, as opposed to the assumption that there's not a problem, these couple things are going to keep you safe. If we had made that mistake by assuming that the root zone was okay, if we had made the mistake of thinking, oh, not even addressing it intellectually, not even thinking about it, then we wouldn't have had those the, those problems with the uh, the flying bugs and, and and the fungal gnats. And uh, because we made that mistake, we did. So 
Thank God it was just that, which is a, uh, a small problem, and that's the thing that was worse. Yeah, I want to encourage you guys, you know, to always be proactive, not only in your grow, in your garden, outside garden, inside garden, and even just your health, right? So many people take their health for granted each and every day. I mean, one of the reasons why I do this video to share with you guys the message of gardening and growing your own food is because I almost lost my life when I was younger, you know, and it's not a fun place to be, and I don't want that to happen to you guys, so I take my health you know, proactively and I do things to encourage my health instead of doing things to not encourage it. Some of the things that may not encourage health in my opinion are things like eating processed foods, things out of packages, bottles, and things from fast food joints. And I know a lot of you guys, the growers out there, you guys don't have time to do all this stuff, you know. I would encourage you to grow some, some edible plants along the side your medicinals and eat more fruits and vegetables whether you're growing them yourself or whether you just got to buy them so that you can be healthier and uh, you know be able to work longer hours and be more you know on point with all this stuff so another question I have for you MIT is you know I saw when you're done with the grow you actually clear out the room and then you literally sterilize it I mean is this also very important it's absolutely critical and it's part of the green, clean green process actually we, we were doing it anyway when they came here for the inspection, we weren't even aware that it was part of the process, and they were they were pleased to find out that we were doing that anyway. And that wasn't something that they had to advise us on. And to do that, we just very simply use either alcohol in the case of cleaning some of the the lights and the light bulbs, and then for the floor surfaces and the wall surfaces, we use hydrogen peroxide, food grade hydrogen peroxide in a, in, a, in a water solution. That's it. It will disinfect. It's all natural. It's clean, green approved, and um, it's safe. And so you want, to, you want to absolutely sterilize your room in between crops to assure that, again, your cultural practices are as high as they can be. And if you're not doing that, then over time you're creating an environment where problems are going to slowly rise. And once you get them, it's hard to, it's hard to get rid of them. So again, it comes back to that prevention uh, versus, versus cure type logic. Right. I mean Prevention is worth a pa uh, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I think that's that's the saying there. So uh, MIT, are there any other kind of pests that may commonly afflict growers out there in, growing indoor? Well, I mean uh, the main ones we've identified, which is the powdery mildew, the spider mites, and of course, of course, the dreaded broad mites, which aren't that common. But if you get them, you've got main you've got major problems. There's some other ones that I've heard about that are root zone based that, that I don't know much about. Um, and of course, there's other there's other things that are smaller uh, root aphids and things like that that will gnaw at your roots. And, and from what I understand, the OG Bio or uh, foliar product is a fantastic one for that. Uh, as well as will kill broad mites and things like that. And that's what I've been told. We you know we don't have any direct experience with that. And we hope to never have any direct experience with that. Um, so there are other things, um, uh, you know, scales and, and things like that, mealy bugs. But they're less common and and, and they're less devastating. So um, be aware of those things. All right, cool. So are there any last words that you'd like to say to all my viewers and all the growers that are watching this episode today? Thank you for watching. Again, if you have any guidance that you can give us or share or, or any feedback, we'd love to hear it. And, um, and again, please, as to the best possible ability that you have, either cultivate in a clean green fashion, or if you have to go and, and procure your medicine from someone, make sure that you know them. Make sure that you're not assuming you're going out to a local dispensary and you're buying something that's not clean green and assuming it's okay. I don't think it is. In my personal opinion, it's probably not. It's been sprayed with something at some point in time and you don't know at what point in time it was sprayed with something and what it was sprayed with. So be aware, be conscious of these things and turn and insist upon clean green certified. Again, you know, you don't have to join a collective, you know, our collective, but but ask questions and, and see who's doing things in the best possible way and support those organizations and join those organizations. Yeah, I, mean, I want to encourage you guys, uh, you know, if you are using medicinally, and I would encourage you guys, instead of even going to a place to buy your own medicine, is to grow it yourself because then you have complete control. You exactly know what's going into your crops and what you're spraying on the crops. And I mean, I encourage you guys to do this with your food as well. Food or medicine, I mean, I think people need to take responsibility for their needs and what they need. If they need some medicine or whether they want to eat some of the best food on earth, they need to grow it themselves because it's, you know, if it's up to industry to do it, whether this is the medicinal cannabis industry or whether it's the agriculture industry, you know, it's quite unfortunate in this day and age, most people are just focused on the almighty dollar. You know, at a younger age, I learned that 
the dollar doesn't mean crap when you're sitting at the edge of your hospital bed. The doctor's telling you that you might not make it out of there. All the money in the world doesn't mean crap. And let me tell you that. So I really want you guys to get off the chems and start eating more natural and organic, you know, smoking it, but also, you know, eating it as well so you guys can be as healthy as possible because it's not all about this money and this life that we live. And we've been led a bunch of BS from powers of bay that, you know, we think money is success. And there's actors and people that are super successful that lose their lives because they're drug overdosing on crap because they're not happy even with all the money. So think about the fellow man, think about the environment, think about how you can help people more by growing in a natural and organic fashion. I really hope you guys enjoyed this episode. It was quite valuable to you to learn about how to grow naturally like you have here today. Be sure to post any comments and questions down below. If you like this video and want to see more videos with MIT, please give me a thumbs up to let me know and I'll be sure to come back to this secret location and uh, get him more on some videos to uh, answer more of your questions and let you guys know how you can grow clean, green, certified and some of the best organic medicinal cannabis that I've ever seen. Once again, my name is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. We'll see you next time and remember, keep on growing. All right, this is John Cole with GrowingYourGreens.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you, and I know what you guys might be thinking. John, why the heck are you walking out of a doctor's office, man, on your gardening show? Well, hey. Well, it's important for, uh, I mean, for quite simply for health reasons. If there weren't any health ramifications, we could use chemicals all day long on everything, and it wouldn't really matter. But the